بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وأهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم uh, We left off in the greater sins we were talking about disobedience to parents and uh, we were talking about some of the ahkam of, of that uh, some of the rulings about um, the oldest son, for example, uh, you know, he his uh, going to jihad or something like this. Sometimes uh, if it's difficult for the parents and he's the only one, then uh, this can get lifted if other people are um, fulfilling that obligation where it's not necessary for him to go. And we were talking about some things. If you're in a mustahab prayer and your mother calls you, you can you should break that prayer or uh, getting permission for making vows and oaths and uh, recommended fasting if the person is under the age of um, becoming uh, balik or mature, the age of puberty. Okay, so we move to the next part. It's talking about respect for parents. Uh, we know that as wajib to respect our parents, so we cannot do any disrespect to them. And this is something natural. No one should want to disrespect the parents. Uh, we should honor our parents for all the sacrifices they have done and all the things they have taken care of us. And we read about uh, the rights of the mother from Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, that there's no way we could even repay our parents because of all the things they have uh, done for us, but we try to do our best with them. Um, one of the things the author says is that one must not address the parents by their names. Uh, however, they can be addressed by their title or by their kunya. Uh, for example, uh, a person has a son named Ali. They call him Abu Ali, or they call like Amir al-Mu'mineen, they call him Abu al-Hasan. Uh, these uh, titles are respect or Ummu Zahra, Ummu Zainab, or Ummu Ali, a mother of, you know, wh whatever their oldest child's name is, is a form of respect that they normally go by this. Or they, um, like the child calls their uh, parents, uh, you know, uh, Baba or, or Ummi or mother or father or some title of respect, but they don't call the child, by, um, the parent by their first name because it's seen as disrespectful. Uh, and I would think this is most cultures, even in the Western culture in America, it's very disrespectful, disrespectful because it's like uh, as, if you, as if you view them and treat them as your peer and not the respect of a parent because we call each other, uh, our friends, we call each other, you know, by our names, Abbas, Jamil, you know, like what, what, uh, the names of each other, we call each other by our first name. So we shouldn't call our parents by our first name because it's uh, disrespectful. Instead, one should not uh, precede them while walking or one should not sit down before they have sat down. All of these things are to honor them and to respect them and not to do it, uh, you know, like if a person sat down before their uh, parents unknowingly or without causing any disrespect, it's not haram, but one shouldn't do it with disrespect. All these are akhlaki things or moral things to give preference to the uh, father and the mother. Uh, we should allow them to sit down first or we should let them uh, lead us. They said that when we have meals with our parents, we shouldn't begin before the parents um, have their meals. Uh, I know in my household, when I, when I was growing up, one of the things they used to do to honor the, the ladies, the men wouldn't sit down until the women sat down. They would let the women sit down first. My grandmother would sit down. My mother would sit down. My aunt would sit down. All of them would sit down. And the, the men would sit down, for example. The children didn't sit down before the, the uh, elders. I uh, said we, one of the akhlaki things is should not sit with one's back uh, to our parents in a gathering. And when we're speaking, we shouldn't rise our voice, uh, raise our voice above their voice, above our parents' voice. Or, for example, they're talking and you cut off your parents, you know, and you, you stop them and, and you raise your voice over theirs and, and cut them off in speaking. We, we shouldn't do that because all of these things are seen as disrespectful. 
uh, said that one shouldn't do anything that would cause parents to become uh, the butt of criticism. So we shouldn't point out their defects. For example, maybe our father is a bit chubby, for example, a little overweight and we say, oh, look at, you know, you're getting uh, fat or something like this. You need to do this or that and make fun of them. Uh, we shouldn't do that. And we shouldn't insult the parents of other people because they would also re, uh, retaliate and insult our parents. So when you insult someone else, you open the door of insult for your own self. So it's, it's not good to insult other people. We all know that. And it's especially is bad for our parents. Um, it said it's the unanimous opinion of the jurists that Ahsan uh, doing good of, to the parents means refraining from everything that displeases them. So even if there's something that's not haram, but they don't like it, we should not do that because this will lead to upsetting our parents. So we should always make sure that our parents are happy. We shouldn't take the trend of what is going on. A lot of people, uh, the problem now in society is that uh, they look to the earth, uh, the common culture or, you know, of the place. So when we're living in the West, they are looking at what everyone else is doing. And I'll form my opinion by what I see. How does everyone else treat their parents? And we see that in America, American kids, a lot of times, disrespect their parents. They even sometimes curse at their parents or say bad things to their parents or tell their parents, I'm not going to do that. And uh, a lot of bad things. And they get these things from television mostly because these uh, shows, for example, maybe some shows on children's networks like uh, Disney or other things. And they have those adolescents. They're not small children. They're not uh, grown either. They're somewhere like preteen age. And we see that the main character a lot of times is always disrespecting their parents. Um, so they watch these things and then they disrespect their parents. Uh, for example, like the cartoon show, like The Simpsons, for example, uh, the, the main character, he's always disrespecting his father and uh, doing bad things to his father and all these things, saying bad things. Kids watch this as a cartoon show. So they see the, that their main character they like is doing this, then they learn this behavior. But we have to teach them not to go outside of the house to learn the behavior. The, we stay in the house of Ahlul Bayt, salam. We learn our akhlaq from house of Ahlul Bayt, from the people of the house, the house of uh, Nubawa, the house of prophethood, house of Wahi, of revelation. We don't need to go to other houses to learn uh, anything. We can have all the teachings. We just have to follow them and set our view, our worldview, and our, our uh, mannerisms to be like theirs as much as we can. He says uh, the following actions are considered disrespectful. Not providing your family with the necessities, your parents with the necessities, and when you have them, you have the necessities and they don't have them, and you make them go outside to beg for the necessities. This is disrespectful. Obviously, we should take care of our parents. They took care of us. Not inviting them to a function where others have been invited. So uh, you're going and uh, they want to go, but they weren't invited. Uh, or not inviting them to the, to the function. So, for example, you have some function, uh, you hold a magic list at your house <clears throat> and you invite everyone, but you tell your parents, no, I don't want you to come. Disrespectful. Uh, not getting presents for them from a place where you have been on a, on a journey. Most of the time we see when people go on a trip, they bring back gifts for their loved ones. So to that we should, it's highly recommended to give nice things to our parents. So if we go on a trip, we bring back things for our parents and give them, it makes them happy. Uh, he says, also the jurists consider the, these following actions uh, haram. To turn away from parents with disdain. To, we see in Quran, it says we shouldn't even say to our parents, which is the smallest thing you can say. 
to turn away from them, they say, say something and you're like, ah, oh, you know, why I want to do that? Or Ugh, like, really, like they ask you to get some water for them. And like, you make a big deal like, oh, oh why you ask me for that? You know, uh, we shouldn't do that. Allah tells us not to even say Ugh, to our parents. Uh, to sit with back towards the parents, to speak in a louder voice than the parents, walking ahead of the parents. Uh, all of these things, the author mentions that these things are haram to do because it causes displeasure to the parents. If any, he says, if any of them does not cause disrespect or displeasure, they are allowed. For example, uh, if your parents do not care if you are sitting somewhere with your back towards them and it doesn't bother them and uh, the society does not look at that as something bad, then it's not haram to do it. But uh, he says it's mustahab, it's recommended still to refrain from those things. He says that just as it is wajib for the children to respect, honor, and fulfill the rights of their parents, it is uh, wajib or incumbent upon the mother and the father to fulfill the rights which the children have on them. So it's not one-sided. Uh, we also have to give rights to our children. If the parents don't fulfill these rights, it would amount to cutting the relations, he says. Since children are the closest to the parents, it's a must to refrain from cutting the relations with them. And cutting relations, family ties, is a uh, big sin, which is the next chapter in this book, actually. He says, just as children become disobedient to parents by not uh, uh, complying with their uh, duties, the parents also become uh, in this type of category if they fail to perform the duties toward their children. Uh, further, he says, the parents should not impose unbearable commands on the children, such that the children are you know, forced to find excuses for not obeying them and becoming disobedient. So we should do things with moderation. We shouldn't overburden our children with too many tasks to where they don't want to help us or they, they look at uh, coming to visit us as a struggle or something that uh, if I go over there, I have to do this and that and this thing and this thing. It's going to take my whole day of all these chores to do. So we shouldn't overburden our children either. He said the parents shouldn't ridicule their children for their actions, shouldn't make fun of our children. Rather, the children must be corrected by constructive criticism. Uh, for example, a child does something. It, it wasn't a good idea. And you say, oh, why are you so dumb? You're stupid. It, you know, that was the stupid thing you did. You shouldn't have done that. You know, where is your brain? You don't think all these things. Uh, to, to, to belittle the child or degrade the children. We have to correct them with constructive criticism. You say, you know, the way you did it, you tried to do it, but you know, this wasn't the best way. There's another way that you can do that's better than this so that this doesn't happen the next time. You learn from this lesson and this is the proper way and this is the best way to do it. And you use that moment as a teaching moment instead of uh, hurling insults at children. He said, ridicule makes the children stubborn and it creates enmity between them and the parents. Uh, no one likes to be called names or be put down or looked at as uh, low. And if the parents always making the child look low, they will have uh, resentment towards them. He said, when the parents fail to fulfill the rights of the children, it induces the children to forsake the rights of the parent and retaliation. They said, they are not doing anything for me. They're not fulfilling my rights, not taking care of me, not doing this. Then why should I take care of them? It, it creates that mood in the children. As a consequence, both the parents and the children in that case are both involved in uh, greater sin. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa said, the parents are liable to be disobedient in the same way that the children who do not fulfill the rights of the parents become involved in the sin of uh, ukuk or the disobedience. So it can uh, be both ways. Both can be involved in disobedience. He said, it's a solemn duty of the parents to behave kindly with their children, give them good training, good education, they should keep them under gentle control and not do anything which would cause them to be disobedient. 
We should have a loving relationship with our children, not a harsh and stern uh, relationship with them. We have to have a gentle control, he says, train them, educate them, uh, give them the best teachings of Ahlul Bayt. We can show them that there are different paths and that this path is going this way. And this is path of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wasalam. They will see from looking at the two paths that uh, path of Ahlul Bayt is afdal. It's uh, higher, uh, better than the other path. He said the parents should overlook the minor slips of the children. Uh, they should appreciate insignificant favors and show happiness and gratitude for those favors because it encourages children to do more good actions. For example, child comes and brings you something. Uh, that you needed and you didn't ask. For example, they come and see you're tired, they make some water for you and they bring it and you don't say anything. You just drink your water and just put it down and say, you know what? I raised this kid and I pay the bills. He, he should bring me water. I don't have to thank him for that. But if you thank them for that and say, I, I really appreciate that, you know, uh, thank you for thinking of me and it will encourage them to do more good things for you and for other people. When they feel underappreciated, then they won't do the action again. They say, well, they don't appreciate, why should I continue doing it? He said, they should make the children aware that they wish the best for them and pray for their happiness in this world and the hereafter. We should always make our children feel that we care about them. Uh, we see a lot of children, they say that, our parents are never happy with us. We can never be good enough in our parents' eyes. They always look down on us. No matter what I do, uh, I can never be good in their eyes. So they are chasing the happiness of their father or their mother. And they, we shouldn't make them chase our happiness. We should tell them we are proud of them. We are happy uh, what they are doing. We you know, are glad to see that they are doing good things and make them feel uh, you know, uh, that we are proud of them. He said, now he'll put some rights of the children upon their parents, as uh, the, some of the jurists have put in Islamic law books. He says, it's wajib upon the parents to bear the expenses of the children right from the time of their birth until they become independent. <clears throat> and in the case of the daughter, until she gets married, then the parents should maintain their, uh, her expenses. Uh, it says one of the most important duties of the father is to arrange for the marriage of the son when he attains maturity, to try to find a, help him find a, uh, you know, facilitate the marriage for him. <clears throat> Not meaning that he has to force his child into a marriage. It was, uh, we're not doing that. Well, we can help find them a suitable uh, partner if they like and if they agree and they say, you know, they like this person, we can help them facilitate them get married. We shouldn't make it harder for them to get married. Um, unfortunately, that is happening all over the world. Uh, the parents, the, the youth, they want to get married, but the parents are making so many obstacles for them, they cannot get married. Either they make the mahar so high they cannot pay it, or they say, <clears throat> you need this type of degree, <clears throat> this type of shape, this type of skin color, this type of degree, this type of house, the house has to have this many square feet, your car has to be this type of car, this level of the car, all of these things. And it makes it almost impossible for people to, to get married. And the prophet never made it hard for people to get married, made it very easy for them. And if we make it hard on them, they will go do other things. Na'udhu <clears throat> Billah. Said the parents, uh, in the case of the daughter, too, the father must strive to find a good match for her. The parents cannot restrain their daughter from getting married, he says. They should not uh, stop them from getting married. Obviously, if the person is bad, this is different. Uh, but if there's suitable match, their religion is good, uh, everything is good, then they should not stop it based on uh, race or other uh, things. He says, the Holy Quran says, Surah Baqarah 232, and do not prevent them from marrying their husbands when they agree among themselves in a lawful manner. So we should try to help our children get married. 
and uh, maintain their religion and not uh, make things difficult. Another important duty for the parents is to give good education to their children, both uh, secular education and religious education. We see that Ahlul Bayt said to take care and uh, attention to uh, educating your children before the corrupt people come and educate your children. So we have to show them the path of Ahlul Bayt and we have to start from within the house. If they need to see us praying, they need to see us fasting. They need to know why we are praying, why we believe in Allah, why we believe in Prophet, why we follow Ahlul Bayt. They need to have a good foundation. We don't want them to, uh, you know, they don't see us pray at home, only in the pray in the, in the center. And they say, okay, in their mind, they say, we only pray in center. We don't need to pray at home. We only do prayer Friday or Thursday night or something like this. No, we have to teach them from home. We also have to help them get a good, uh, we can say, secular education for their job and their, um, you know, their work and these things. The, the parents must strive to instruct the children with regards to the fundamentals of uh, their religion, the seriousness and significance of observing the laws of Islam, uh, the ahkam should be in, inculcated in the children and no leniency should be shown if the religious laws are not strictly followed. We need to be on top of them for salat, for fasting, for all of these things. We need to teach them. We have to uh, get this built inside their fitra. So, you know, it's very important. If we don't do this, then they will pick up other habits. But if we teach them from young age, they will have this uh, in, in their um, nature. Uh, for example, uh, in one of my classes on the fasting, I was taking uh, Ahkam, it was Shahid Athani was saying that we should uh, have our children start fasting or practicing fast not the whole fast, but practicing at the age of seven. And then when we, they get to age nine, for the boys, we should be on top of them, more uh, serious that they should keep fasting. Because if you wait till they become balig and say, okay, now you have to fast. They have had no practice. It'll be difficult for them. They're not used to it. They're not going to want to do it. And they will fail uh, in their fast sometimes. And then they will have uh, they will have kafara, they will have many issues they will have to face. So we have to uh, be on top of them about these things. <clears throat> he says, uh, however, the aspect of amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, enjoining good and forbidding the wrong, must be kept in mind. And we should encourage them to do good and forbid them to uh, do wrong. And don't we cannot just tell them, don't do this thing with no explanation. Children are inquisitive. They're curious. We have to tell them, you know, uh, why is this action bad? Why? Is, what are some reasons? Maybe it's not the exact reason, but some reasons that this thing could be bad for us. So they realize that this action is not good for us, that we shouldn't do it. You know, um, uh, children are like sponges, you know, they're absorbing everything from a young age and they are looking to their parents, they're looking to society and other people around them to learn about life. So we have to give them uh, good examples. We have to be active in encouraging them to learn proper tools so that uh, that will guide them throughout life. We have to give them Quran. We have to give them uh, teachings of Prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Uh, like I said, we need to lead by example, not just telling them uh, this is the way, but we have to lead by example. We can't leave them to navigate their life without the roadmap. We have the roadmap. As Muslims, we have the, uh, what Allah instructed the Prophet to leave behind uh, the Thakalain, the Quran and Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. So we have to uh, not just say it, but do it. I remember I had a roommate one time when I was about 17 years old and he he said that he was a Muslim and I was like oh really so uh, this is before I took my shahada I was learning about Islam 
So he said, I'm a Muslim. I, I can tell you about it. So I was like, okay, tell me about it. He said, Muslims, they pray five times a day. They do this, they do that. And I was like, I'm in the room with you the 24 hours a day. I don't see you pray. You know, oh, I pray while I'm lying down. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, you are praying lying down, you know. So I didn't take him seriously because I was like, uh, I don't think you're really a Muslim because you're not praying. You're saying you believe in all these things and these are all the actions you are doing, but I haven't seen you do any of the actions. So the kids will look at us the same way if we say we stand on these things, but in reality, uh, maybe outside the house, we are portraying, uh, people are portraying that. But inside the house, they're doing something else. They will not take us seriously. So we have to lead by examples. You know, if we wait too long and uh, before we begin to teach them about Islam, it'll be too late in most cases. Uh, I've seen it happen a lot of times. The youth, you know, they, they abandon Salat, for example, teenagers. They don't care for religion at all. They go out in the streets and do all sort of haram. And then all of a sudden, the parents are coming to the center and they're saying, you know, uh, please help my children. My children are, are lost, you know. Uh, and then the Imam Jamaah, he says, why didn't you bring them here? You never bring them at all. You don't, I've been telling you, bring them for Dua Kamil, bring them for Juma, bring them for Saturday school, bring them for the youth program. You never bring them. And uh, all the time, and now, you are wondering why they're out. They say, give me some dua to get my child off of drugs or to get my child out of jail. It doesn't happen like that. It needs to start from early age to teach them about all of these things and cultivate that in them. Cannot come in the end after they've already gone. I mean, we have to do what we can and help them, but uh, a lot of these things can be pre prevented in most cases. He says, uh, uh, various traditions stress upon the duty of the parents to shower their love and affection on the children. We shouldn't be cold to our children. We have to uh, be loving and affectionate to our children. Uh, I remember I had a friend of mine, he told me his mother never told him that uh, she loved him until he was about 30 years old. And he cried when he heard that for the first time. Imagine, you know, like uh, we have to have a uh, show our children that we care about them and that we love them and then they uh, will cling to us and they'll want to follow us and learn from us, especially at a young age. A little bit later down the road, uh, uh, they get a bit difficult, you know, but if we start from young, we will cultivate good things in them, inshallah. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala says, be affectionate to your children and have mercy upon them. When you promise them something, fulfill your promise. Because the children put hope only in their parents. When a promise is not fulfilled, it causes dissatisfaction and strains relationships. Certainly Allah is the most wrathful when the women and the children are disheartened. So we shouldn't let them down. Uh, I was reading narration earlier today uh, that was saying that, uh, paraphrasing that we are a people, we Ahlul Bayt are a people that uphold our promises. Our promises are like covenants and they don't break their covenants. So when we make a promise with someone, we need to uphold that promise because it is like a covenant with uh, the other person. So we shouldn't promise things and make empty promises. Uh, leaving the children with no hope. They say, oh, you promised me you would do this, and then we don't do it. If we, same thing, we promise our, our uh, wife, we will do this, and we don't do it. When he said, uh, Rasulullah says, when Allah is the most wrathful, when the women and the children are disheartened. You know, so we have to be careful with this thing because it is not good. We see the what the prophet has said about it. Also, we have to be careful not fulfilling promises when we tell our children, uh, inshallah. Because a lot of time, you know, I ask people jokingly because this is the state that we have gotten to that, uh, you know, uh, which type of inshallah is this? Is this the inshallah, which means, uh, no, I'm okay, I'm not going to do it. You know, I just say inshallah. Or is this inshallah like you really want to do this? And you're hoping Allah wills for you to do this because this is how it has gotten. But if we tell our children, 
inshallah. They say, oh, I want to, you know, go to the park. You say, inshallah. But in your mind, you already know you're not going to the park. You are, have work and you have other things to do and you know you're not going to take them. If we tell them, inshallah, and they put hope in, in that, inshallah, and then we know that we're not going to fulfill this uh, thing, then it can build mistrust in Allah. Because they say, every time you say, inshallah, when we, it never happens. So don't say, inshallah, anymore. You know, uh, imagine this, uh, this can happen. He says, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has told, has told that when a person kisses the child, his child, a good deed is recorded in his a'mal, his scroll of deeds. Uh, so when we kiss our son or daughter, a good deed is recorded. It's recommended for us to do that. He says that the daughters are more deserving of kindness. He says the parents have been ordered to be more kind towards the daughters. It's must to have that when a father brings something for the children, he must first offer for the daughter, especially for the one who is named Fatima. So we see that when people come and say Islam gives no rights to women, they have no rights whatsoever. But if you re read and learn about Islam, they will realize that it's the opposite. Paradise is at the feet of who? The mother. All the rights are given to, we see how much rights are given to the mother. And here, even when we bring something, <clears throat> it's mustahab, highly recommended that he offer his daughter first, not to the sons. He says, if children oppose the parents, they must never be abused or reviled. The curses of the parents cause an increase in the misery of the children. <coughs> As I said before, we shouldn't insult our children and we shouldn't curse at our children. Imagine someone is cursing at their child, you know, uh, uh, you know, sending Latin, for example, on their child. It will cause a lot of uh, you know, hardship on the child, misery on the child, and will have effects on their personality in the future. He, he says, whatever has been mentioned till now concerns the biological parents. However, the spiritual fathers or, or the guides of humanity are the prophet and his Ahlul Bayt salam. He said, all of us are spiritually related to them. We are connected uh, to them. Uh, we have seen in narrations, for example, we, we have orphaned, but the, another type of orphan is not the one who lost the, their parents, but another type of orphan is the one who does not know their imam. These are also orphan. So we see that there is a relation between us and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, that they are, they are our guides and that we are spiritually related and connected to them. He says, in every circumstances, their followers can be enriched by virtues and get protection from calamities. The Prophet ﷺ has informed, I and Ali are the fathers of this ummah. The spiritual fathers, the author says, are superior to the biological fathers, to the biological parents in a manner that the soul is superior to the physical body. Don't we say, may my mother and father be sacrificed for you in ziyarat? Or when the, the companions come to the imams, they say, may uh, my mother and father be sacrificed for you. This means that they put them above their parents. So he says that similarly, the punishment of the disobedient of the spiritual fathers is much more severe than that of the of disobedience to the ordinary parents. Subhanallah. We think about doing disobedience to our parents as something that is terrible. But what is even worse is disobedience to our spiritual fathers, is disobedience to the commands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. But a lot of times we don't think about it and we disregard these we only think about the, our, our biological parents. But we have to think, I don't want to displease my spiritual parents. 
As Prophet says, I and Ali are the fathers of this Ummah. We don't want to disappoint the Holy Prophet. Imagine Day of Judgment, the Prophet comes and says, he is not from me. It's the worst sentence that we could hear. He says, the rewards for the kindness to the spiritual father is a thousand times more than the kindness to the real parents. For example, we give something uh, to our parents, a gift. We get a reward for giving our parents a gift. He says, rewards for kindness to the spiritual father is a thousand times more than this. So when we give sadaqah, we can say, uh, I want the thawab of this action, you know, to go to Ahlul Bayt. I want, I do, uh, for example, reading Quran. I want the thawab of me reading the Quran to go towards Imam Zaman, Allah Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif, for example. <coughs> In the same way that the disobedience of a spiritual father is far more severely punishable. Heaven is prohibited for the person who disobeys the spiritual father. None of his deeds are accepted even if he prays the nights and fasts during the day. The punishment for those who do not acknowledge the walayat of Ahlul Bayt is, is more severe because the Ahlul Bayt salam, he says, are the real spiritual fathers. It would be wrong to consider all uh, the Quranic verses and traditions. He said it would, yeah, in connection with disobedience to the parents to be restricted to only the biological fathers. He said be wrong to restrict these. It applies also to the spiritual fathers as well. And we know that cutting the relation with the fa spiritual fathers or, or the, cutting the relations with our family is haram. So cutting relations with the spiritual fathers of the Ummah is also haram. This is why he's saying that rejecting walaya is uh, one of the you know, greater sins. Because you're cutting relations with the ones Allah has appointed to look over us, to oversee us, to be our guides. <clears throat> he says the Holy Quran and Hadith are unanimous in declaring that the commands for the uh, disobedience to the parents apply equally and more stringently to the spiritual as well as the biological parents. The ultimate argument in this connection is the Quranic verse where Allah has ordered obedience towards the parents along with his own worship. He says, be grateful to me and both of your parents. Surah Luqman, ayat 14. Imam Ridha alayhi salam, he says, indeed Allah has commanded three things in the Quran which are approximated with three other things. He ordered the prayers and the, and the charity. So one who offers prayers and does not pay the charity, the zakat, his service is not accepted from him. He ordered giving thanks to him and that of the parents. So the one who does not thank his parent has not thanked Allah. And he has commanded fear of Allah and connecting with the uh, kinship, the uh, family ties. So the one who does not connect with the blood relations or the family ties is not afraid of Allah. From uh, you know Akbar Ridha from Shaykh al Saduq. Then he says, and your Lord has commanded, the author brings another ayah, and your Lord has commanded that you shall not serve any but him and do goodness to your parents. Surah uh, Bani Israel, ayah 23. He says, similar reference to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Ahlu Bayt alayhi wa salam will be found in the next chapter. And he brings uh, two narration, he says, from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. The first one, they asked about, a uh, companion asked about the meaning of this ayah in Surah Ra'ad, Surah 13, Ayah 21, and those who join that which Allah has bidden to be joined and have all of their Lord, and they fear the evil reckoning. He said the next uh, tradition is concerned with the tafsir of the same ayat. It said that this says that the this ayat was revealed in relation uh, about the holding or connecting the family ties to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala and Ahlul Bayt alayhi the close relatives of the believer being included in it. 
So it's not restricted. The Imam said it's not restricted just to, to your, it has different meanings. One meaning is also obviously for the believer to hold the relation with his family, to keep relations with his family. But there is another meaning, an inner meaning, which is to keep relation and close tie with Prophet and Ahlul Bayt And he says, the tradition goes on and says, do not be of those who restrict this ayat to some particular personalities. But whenever you hear of a verse regarding a kind of people, you must consider it to be applicable to the, uh, to the other people of the same kind. So he's saying, don't restrict the ayat because you see the outer appearance of just to your family. No, it also has an inner meaning, which is keeping close relation to Prophet and his family. <clears throat> the last paragraph, and we will end here, and we'll end this chapter, inshallah. He says, the disobedience of the spiritual fathers means to disobey their commands and to be heedless of their orders. The Ahlul Bayt, we disobey them and all of their commands, and we don't care what they say. This is disobedience to uh, the spiritual fathers, a sort of disobedience to parents. To sever relations with them in this world by not acknowledging their leadership, not acknowledging that they have walaya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ridha alayhi salam uh, asked, won't you feel bad if your parents are displeased with you and they say that you are not their child? Imagine. Mother, father said, that, that child is not mine. I don't claim him. He's not from me. He's not one of our family. And cut the relation. What he said, Imam says, won't you feel bad if your parents say that about you? Everyone answered, yes, obviously. Uh, the Imam continued, the spiritual parents are superior to your biological parents. Don't give them an opportunity to say this. Rather, consider yourself lucky to be their son or their daughter. Imam Ridha is saying, don't give Ahlul Bayt or don't give uh, the Prophet <clears throat> the opportunity to say this. By uh, You have to obey them, follow them. Don't be disobedient to them to give them the opportunity to say that these are not from amongst my followers. They, are, they don't belong to me. I am uh, away from them, for example and consider us ourselves to be lucky to be connected to them, to, to be their son or their daughter in this spiritual sense. Inshallah, Allah makes all of us uh, cling fast to the walayat of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and that they will be uh, proud of us that we have worked hard in their path, inshallah. We'll end here. Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج